We all know the old adage that you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And I think that's especially true uh, here lately, the last few years in our world. I feel like it's only when we are divided and isolated. Then and only then do we truly value how good it is to be together. Loneliness is an ache like no other. A few years ago during COVID lockdowns, we all got a chance to see up close and personal like that certainly you can praise God all by yourself. But it means more. And it moves you more when we do it. Psalm 34, 3, David said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. David is an expert on praise, wrote more about praise than anybody. And David knows, sure, I can praise the name of the Lord and worship the Lord and hear the word of the Lord all by myself. But I I sure do like it better when, when we're together. We were not designed by our God to be alone, without community, without connection, without togetherness. Genesis 2.18, God looked at the man he created and said, it is not good for man to be alone. Ecclesiastes, the chronicled wisdom of Solomon, he says in Chapter 4, verse 9, that two are better than one. And then in verse 12, he says, in a threefold cord is not easily broken. In other words, the more you add to the group, the harder it is to break. Now, David understood something about this concept of togetherness that I want you to understand. Because he went through a time in his life where he didn't want to go to church. He wasn't personally motivated to go to the house of the Lord. And I know you've never been through a time where you didn't feel like going to church. And the scripture doesn't tell us what specifically caused it. Maybe it could have been when the whole country found out about his issue with Bathsheba. For those of you who are not up on the story, one day King David is out on his balcony and he catches in his peripheral. Uh, (laughs) Over here somewhere is a naked woman bathing on her roof and he fell in lust with her and he goes and he sleeps with her and she shows up to the palace a couple of weeks later and says, I'm late. He said, for what? <clears throat> so he cooks up this plan, you know, he, he brings her husband home from the battlefield, hoping that her husband will go home and take comfort with his wife, but her husband is too loyal. He feels like he doesn't deserve to be home in the comfort of his own bed while his brothers are out on the battlefield, so the husband sleeps outside the palace gates. So then David cooks up the strategy, well, let's put him on the front line of the war, even though he was high ranking, let's put him on the front line and make sure, make sure he gets killed. And David quickly marries Bathsheba so that, you know, the dates will line up. Nobody in here ever tried to line any dates. And then Nathan, the prophet comes to David and, and says, the Lord is displeased with this. David begins to repent before the Lord, but, but the whole country found out about it. Maybe that's why he didn't want to go to church. Because public shame often causes us to isolate ourselves. Or maybe it was when David's baby died. The Bible tells us that all while his child was sick, that David laid in the floor praying and begging God to heal the child. 
David refused to eat or drink anything. David nearly died himself from malnutrition because he was fasting and praying for the life of his child. And the baby died. Sometimes grief causes us to isolate ourselves. I don't feel like going. I prayed and, and what I was desperately praying for didn't happen. I don't, I don't feel like going today. But whatever the reason was, David went through a season where personally, individually, I, just, I don't want to go. But then he says in Psalm 122.1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I want you to lean into the pronouns there a little bit in this verse so you can really see what he's talking about. He said, I was glad. I is an individual word. It connotes singularity. It connotes the idea of being one. I was glad. Why was I glad? Because they. I was glad when they said unto me. They is a word that connotes others. Those other than I are called they. I was glad when they said to me, let us. Us is a word that connotes community, fellowship, connection, and togetherness. <clears throat> so put it all together. David is saying, I was isolated. I was depressed. I was running out of faith. I didn't feel like going. I was hopeless. But I was glad when others around me invited me to become an us. They were going to the house of the Lord, and they stopped by and invited me to become an us with them and go to the house of the Lord. As I started to read that and ponder on that, I wondered, I had a question pop into my mind. I wonder how many people's lives in our circles would be changed if we would invite them to become an us with us and go into the house of the Lord. Now, I believe in my spirit that there's a revelation here. The Holy Ghost wants to deposit in this church at this time. In a time marked by extreme division, we have never been more divided than we are right now in this country. We have never been more divided in the pulpits across America than we are right now. We have never been more divided, even in some cases our own families, than we are right now. And yet, in this time, I believe God is calling his people out of them, they, and I concepts and calling us back to what he intended us to be, which is the great and mighty mighty us, a people known for being together, not defined by the color of our skin or our preferred political affiliation, but defined rather by our unity and our connectivity with one another. I prophesy to you that the next move of God is a we and an us move. No more in singularity. No more individualistic. It's going to be a we move and an us move. I need somebody to holler with me together. The scripture tells us this over and over again, and somehow we have gotten away from it. The scripture says to rejoice with them who rejoice. Why? Because victories are sweeter when they are shared. It tells us to weep with those who weep. Why? Because burdens are lighter when they are shared. It says clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Why? Because praise has more penetration trading power when we do it <clears throat> clap your hands together and praise the Lord clap your hands together and praise the Lord my brother I gotta have a little bit more
Psalm 122, verse 3. Look at it. It says, Jerusalem. Jerusalem here is significant because it's speaking of the house of God, the place where the temple rested. I still got to have a little bit more. I'm going to preach to you with everything I got, but I ain't got much. And if I don't get more in my ears, my throat's going to go out. <laughs> Jerusalem is a city that is builded or compacted together. One translation says it's a city whose fellowship is complete. Now, that word compacted, it's prophetic. We have these things called trash compactors. And what it does, you can take many different items and then you put it in there and you push that button and all of a sudden it begins to press the things together until many different things become one thing. Many Different items become one item. Paul said it this way in the New Testament. We are many members compacted together into one body. Every individual adds something to the overall whole. Do me a favor. Add your voice to this. Tell the person sitting next to you, you matter way more than you think you do. Now, look behind you and grab somebody and tell them, you matter way more than you think you do. You matter more than you realize that you do. In the house of the Lord. Oh, I love it. In the house of the Lord. I cease to be an I, and I become an us. For instance, this morning, in the house of the Lord, some of us are old. Some of us are young. Some of us are Black, white, brown. Some of us, because of our culture, because of what we we're exposed to, because of our raising, some of us can sing so pretty. Some of us, when we sing, it sounds like a cat being strangled with barbed wire. Some of us can move and sway with the drums and clap and even dance. And some of us, when we try to dance, it looks like we've been struck by the lightning. And yet, in spite of our diversity and in spite of our differences, when we come into the house of the Lord, we're together. Some of us are Democrats. Some of us are Republicans. Some of us are independents that don't care about anything that's going on. <laughs> and don't understand why everybody else is in such a fuss. But when we come in here, by God's design, we are come. Compacted together. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compacted together. Now, let's zoom in on the one part of this psalm that I believe is prophetic for us this morning. Verse 2, he says, Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Put that up there. I want them to see that. I'll wait for you. I'm sorry. Yeah, two. <clears throat> Our feet shall stand. Now, the shall there is important because the shall there indicates a juxtaposition of condition. If I'm saying my feet shall stand, that means there's something going on in my life right now that makes me unable to stand. But my belief is that my feet shall stand within the gates, not outside the gate, not at the gate, but within the gates at the house of the Lord. My, my feet shall stand. And notice, he doesn't just say that about himself as an individual. 
He includes the collective in the prophecy. He doesn't say my feet. He says our feet shall stand, may not be standing right now. But our feet shall stand in the gates, within the gates of the house of the Lord. So many things in life can knock you off of your feet. Not everybody that walked in here is on their feet in every area of their life. Some people you walked in here, but in your finances, you've been knocked off your feet. Or in your family, you've been knocked off your feet. Or in your health. Or in your marriage, you've been knocked off your feet. But regardless of what has knocked you off your feet, the promise is when I get in the gates of the house of the Lord, our feet shall stand. Say that with me. Our feet shall stand. I might be down right now, but I prophesy over my life and I prophesy over the us that I represent. Our feet shall stand. Something about those gates, something about God's presence, something about God's word, something about being with God's people. Our feet shall stand. Now that's encouraging. It's motivating. It's good, <clears throat> but it's just a prophecy. And the thing about a prophecy is, a prophecy is just a prophecy until it comes to pass. Our feet shall stand when I get to the house of the Lord. Our, our feet shall stand. In the Old Testament, there's this reoccurring concept, the concept of the house of the Lord. Many of the writers that we look back and we respect wrote about the house of the Lord. Jacob was the first one to talk about the house of the Lord. And then we see David and we see Daniel and we see Isaiah and we see Elijah and we see Jeremiah. We see them talking about the house of the Lord. The prophet Amos spoke to us and taught us about the house of the Lord. Haggai talked to us about the house of the Lord, saying that the glory of the latter house would be greater than the glory of the former house. All of the Old Testament is filled up with this concept of going to the house of the Lord. But in the New Testament, the Lord of the house came down into the world he created. Jesus is the Lord of the house, and he came down. He was born of a virgin. He ministered for three and a half years, preaching the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus was arrested. He was tried. He was crucified, and he died to pay the penalty for all of our sins. And on the third day after he died, he rose bodily from the dead. It's, it's, the, it's the Greek word anastasis, what we call resurrection. It's the Greek word anastasis, which is literally translated to stand back up again. In other words, he went through something that laid him flat on his back. He was wrapped up like a mummy in grave clothes. But on the third day, the power of the anastasis hit Jesus and he stood back up again. That is the power of the resurrection, the power to cause you, no matter the case, to stand back up again. That's how all four of our gospels end. The death, the burial, and the resurrection, or the stand back up again, Jesus. And then the first book of the Bible after the gospels is the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus brings his disciples to the outskirts of the city, and he tells them that he is ascending. He is going to be with his father, but he tells them to wait for the promise that he had given them. He tells them to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, and he said, you shall receive promise power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What power? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the anastasis of God, the ability to stand back up again. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So go and wait. And here's the only thing, boys. I want to make sure you wait 
together. <clears throat> so Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, all of the disciples, the 120, they were all with one accord. That's, that's unity. And they were all in one place. That's together. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where, where, where they were sitting and appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it, it, the one Holy Spirit sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In other words, the one Spirit of God filled all those believers until the they became an us. That's what caused the church to be born. It's when the they became an us. Somebody say together. So Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends promises the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down and fills all of the believers and creates an us out of the they. Then Acts chapter 3 is the first miracle of the New Testament church, and I believe it is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Psalm 122. Let's see if we can find any similarities in it, shall we? Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up Together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried. He was carried. And, and they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them who entered into the temple. I have to pause my message just for a second. And I have to say how thankful I am to God for all of the people that he sent into my life that carried me. Everybody needs to be carried sometimes. My grandparents carried me. My parents carried me. I've had aunts and uncles that have carried me. I've had friends that have carried me. There's been seasons where my wife had to carry me. I'm just thankful that God loved me enough to put some people in my life that would carry me. It would carry me. <clears throat> they couldn't cure me, but they carried me. That's a blessing in and of itself. Because a lot of people don't love you enough to carry you. They'll try to cure you. And when the cure doesn't work, they throw you away because you're nothing but dead weight and a burden. But God will send somebody around your life. He'll put somebody in your circle that, that don't mind the fact that you're not cured yet. They will get up under the load and pick you up and carry you. And, and the scripture said that this man may not have had his legs, but he, he had a couple of people around him that didn't mind getting up under his dead weight and carry Carrying him to the gate. <clears throat> of the temple. The house of the Lord. But. While I appreciate. All of the many. They. That have carried me. They. Can only carry you. Notice the Bible doesn't say that they took him in the temple. The Bible doesn't say they took him inside the gate. Rather, they, they laid him at, at the gate, the gate which was called beautiful. So he's at a beautiful gate with an ugly problem. Have you ever had an ugly problem? in a beautiful place. Over here in your life, it's beautiful. Over there, it's ugly. And, he, and he's laying at, at a beautiful gate. And then all of a sudden, 
the scripture says, Acts chapter uh, 3, verse 4. Let me, let me say one thing about this. I need to explain before I get here why they couldn't take him into the temple. There was a law in the Pentateuch, the law of Moses, that said no one was allowed to go into the temple that couldn't stand on their own two feet. Sitting was not allowed in the holy place. In fact, if you do your study on the tabernacle, you'll find out that there are no seats. There's no place to rest. The priest himself, the high priest, was not even allowed to sit or lay in the temple. So unless you could stand before God for yourself, you could not go into the holy place. So because of that law, the closest this man could get was at the gate. Not, not in the gate, but, but at the gate. But all of a sudden, here come Peter and John together, carrying the Holy Spirit, carrying that same power that raised Jesus and put him back on his feet again. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look at, there's power in the us. You missed it, but it's okay. There's power in the us. He doesn't say, look at me. He says, look at us. Verse 5. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter and said, then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Next verse. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And after a long process. After fasting and praying for months. Immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. Next verse. And he leaping up and walked and with them into the temple. Our feet shall stand within the gates of the house of the Lord. Stand to your feet. Give the Lord a praise all over the house this morning. Together. Together. We are we are more powerful. We have more capability. We have more strength when we connect together. When I step into the house of the Lord, I am no longer just an individual. I am part of the body of Christ. We are many members. We are one body. The hand cannot say to the eye, I have no need of thee. Now I'm praying for you. And there's some elders praying for you today too. If there's any area in your life where you have been knocked off of your feet, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that the power of the resurrection, the ability to stand back up again, would flow in this house, the house of the Lord. And I declare this prophecy. God's already made it come to pass once in the scripture. I believe he'll do it again. I declare over your life, you're going to stand back up again. Wherever you're flat on your back, if it's in your family, your finances, your health, your mental health, wherever 
you're flat on your back. I declare over your life in the name of Jesus, you will stand back up again. In fact, I commission you as a prophet right now. I want you to tell three people you're going to stand back up again. Tell them. Go tell them. Tell three people you're going to stand back up again. In fact, tell somebody, I command you to get up. <clears throat> Come on, tell them. Tell them. Tell them. I command you to get up. Get up. Get up out of that anxiety. Get up out of that depression. Get up out of that loneliness. Get up out of that fear. Get up. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice. Thank you that when we come into your house, we become the God-appointed, God-blessed, God-intended us. Lord, I ask you that you would, you would prick our hearts and make us sensitive because there's people, there's people around us. There's people in our lives. There's people in our circle that need the saving knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need the encouragement. They need the strength that comes from going into the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Give us boldness to share our faith. Give us boldness to invite people to church. Give us boldness. Give us boldness to tell somebody that doesn't want to go, hey, come with me. Come become an us with me. Come become an us with, with me. And Lord, then give them the ability to stand back up again. I lift up the friends and the family members of every person in this room. The friends and the family members that are flat on their back in a troublesome situation in their life right now. In the name of Jesus. Come on, pray for them with me. Pray for your family. Pray for your friends. In the name of Jesus, I command them to stand back up again. In Jesus' name. You're going to stand back up again I feel somebody getting up right now I feel somebody getting up right now listen the man the man had been listen the man had been lame from his mother's womb that means he had never stood When he comes in contact with the power of the Holy Spirit from the God appointed us that walked by, he was able to do something he had never done before in his life. I prophesy over you in this room and watching online. The Holy Spirit is going to empower you to do something you've never done in your life. Some of you never owned a home. You're going to own it. You're going to own it. You're going to own it. Some of you never started your own business. You're going to start it. You are going to start it. You are going to do some things you have never done in your life. You're going to stand in ways you've never stood. You're going to stand in ways you've never stood. You're going to stand in ways you've never stood. I thank God for all the people that carried me. But God didn't design us to be carried forever. God wants you to stand back up again. He wants you to stand back up again. He wants you to stand back up again. So be blessed in the name of Jesus. Be strengthened in the name of Jesus. May your feet in whatever area, may your feet receive strength right now according to the grace of God. Give God one more great hand praise all over the house.